Hey guys, what's up? It's Alexander Williamson, and I am here to reveal the secret history and science living inside of your aquarium. Today we're going to be talking about spawning, aka breeding or reproducing or making free money and free fish and friends. Uh, Celestial Pearl Danios. So they are a little fish out of Myanmar. If you want to uh, check out a profile on them, uh, there's a video not long ago that I made that has all sorts of good info. Uh, the, the relevant part of that video that you need to know about this, all their parameters for just staying happy, that's what I'm going to keep them in as far as trying to get them to breed, which they do nearly daily. But the part that you want to take note of was the sexing. And while I have them nice and close, I want to teach you really quickly uh, how to do that most easily. So the very easiest way is to look for the black dot by the anal fin. So right here we have uh, a black dot right by uh, right by the, that anal fin in here. Um, there you go. So you can see that. You can also see the gills have almost no cover as far as pigmentation over them. They've got a nice purple, plus they uh, stand out nicely. And the female has kind of a, a hump to her and then more of a flattened belly. But if you were to look at her front on, like that way, as she just turned, it's more bulbous or round. Whereas these males, and I just happen to swoop from down here where there's a whole bunch of uh, little fish swimming all over the place. So I just happened to get what I got, and I got one female, so I'll probably take another swoop in it after this video, and in the morning we'll have better odds for egg laying. But these males here, they're a little more narrow when you look at them straight on, and then they definitely, if you have a choice between fish, they have far brighter orange finage and, uh, on top, bottom, and tail, as well as more of a bronze or blue, a blue bronze background with the dots uh, on the, like the, the pigmentation dots on their side pattern is more. Uh, contrasting. Sorry, it was lost for a word for a minute there. Now, these two specimens of Celestial Pearl Daniels came from two different sources. One came from Aquarium Co-op, and the bright orange one happened to come from uh, Aquarium Zen. And Aquarium Zen has... Uh, no. He knows for sure that his were wild-caught. So the wild caught one happens to have a bright orange. These other ones, which I did not inquire where they were caught, uh, have a little bit more of like a pastel yellow or like a sunflower orangey yellow as their markers. And the female does too, but her fins are just a lot smaller and less pronounced. The color's a lot less bright. And some of this is because they're stressed in this teeny little fry pen. But that's just variations. It can happen just because of collection points and differences in micro ecosystems. But it also happens a lot with line breeding. So it, it could be the case that one set of these was line bred in tanks or ponds at a fish farm and the others were not. But the males tend to have, and that's why this is a good example, because you can see how different the fish can look, even though they're identical, genetically speaking, they're the same species from the same very small valley and two rivers, so there's not a huge range you wouldn't think anyways, but there there can be some variation, which is tricky when sexing, so look for that dot by the anal fin, you can usually see it right as they turn, and you can't see it on any fish here except for this gal right here. And you can see it really well when she turns. Plus, as I said, she is nice and wide <clears throat> as she turns. So that is one great way to tell. The colors are another, with the males tending to have a darker bluish 
greenish hue behind their the contrast of their spots and the females having more of a cream or yellow clear sedated um, subdued version of that so now that we have that squared away which can be half the battle take a couple of them and I say a couple I mean anywhere from two to six of them and you can put them in a breeder box you can put them in a 10 gallon tank they do better in just a big tank I just don't have a free tank at the moment but I don't like to expose them to stress for prolonged periods of time so what I'll do is at night you know it's 10 o'clock now the lights are going to be going out soon they've been fed in this little pen there is some water lettuce up here just to keep them content but hopefully since they're egg scatterers they're going to be dropping the eggs rather than sticking them up to the lettuce, but they will do that from time to time. It's just they tend to scatter as they go and have it fertilized as, they, as, as it falls, uh, and then it settles down in the water <clears throat> and becomes uh, viable eggs, which then turn into little teeny tiny fry that are like the size of a comma on a on a piece of paper so you can see the other fry that are swimming around in this tank and getting along with my endlers and this is the largest fish in this tank right now is this female endler and she's getting along just fine with uh, the other critters in the tank including the smallest fry over here so the CPDs have very teeny fry and they need to be alone for a number of days first so from the time they lay these eggs till the time they hatch it's usually somewhere between three and four days 80 hours being what I've read as the average and a funny little fact was when they were brought into the United States as a new fish to study uh, within few days of arriving in the lab before they were even trying to breed them or they hadn't even sorted them or anything. There were actually eggs and uh, fry because they had cleaned out the tank and moved them to another tank right away. So uh, at both Harvard and a few other institutions that got a hold of them, they had babies very, very rapidly after arriving for classification and studying in 2006 and seven. So they're a great fish to try and breed if you're trying to breed egg scatterers for the first time now there's two ways we can do this i like to do it all three ways <laughs> um that should be both two ways plus uh when you are doing both at the same time i'm counting that is the the third way so third way would be to have some floating debris uh for them to attach eggs to and see you're actually seeing stuff fall down so i'm not going to mess with that too much it's agitating the fish too the second way would be for them to have a grate. Usually with most fish, you have a grate like this, and this grate fits in there, and the eggs fall through, but the fish don't. Now, CPDs are so small that they will fit right through these Petco or PetSmart or wherever you get mass-produced grates. The other option is you can use a fry pen, something like this. Uh, let's get the, yeah, something like this, but some of the eggs are so small that they can fall through mesh on a lot of products as well as they can float up towards the top snails can get in they can still get in here uh, but it has a nice lid that i can snap onto it if i would like to so the only way they're going to get in is very small snails through the the grates on the side that being said it's very hard to keep the baby fry in this container because they're going to fit through even those small side grids and that's when you might want a specimen container or a separate tank once they do hatch but these little danios are very prolific and in the morning almost every morning they uh, zip around when the lights come on and within an hour of that they often lay eggs and they'll either stick them to vegetation or a mop which you can make out of thread or shirt or Anything you want. If you want it to have longevity, you'll make it out of acrylic or uh, some sort of non-toxic plastic-based or polymer-based uh, material, thread or wool, uh, synthetic wool. But 
I also use cloth made out of cotton or hemp and then just pull it out of the tank. For some reason, I've noticed that they like biologically uh, composed things a little bit more than the acrylic, just from my experience with uh, several different species. And you want to be careful of dyes and things like that when you're doing that. So I'm not going to go through all the pH and the current and the temperature and all of that stuff because it's in the last video and you can refer to that. I will most likely have a link in the description for that. I wanted to show you one other uh, container and this was the one I had planned on using. Uh, I've used this for even like neon tetras and the CPDs move in a way that is more uh, graceful maybe or acrobatic than the tetras and because of the way they their fins are not rigid and not that tetra fins are but they protrude more and therefore they don't attempt to swim with them open like that but this is another standard box the slots are much smaller like almost nothing can get through here it's thinner than you know a credit card or anything like that and so it actually takes a while for water to fill <clears throat> so from there you've got this contraption here which you can then put in like this and you set let me get this oriented so you get this set like this and you drop it in and in theory all the eggs that are laid and all the male fertilization of those eggs with different species of animals ends up in the bottom now, that then should, in theory, leave you a nice line of eggs in the center. However, these specific fish were able to slip right through uh, this. Let's see if we can get that seam to show. Yeah, they were able to slip right through this when they turned sideways and squeezed a little. And when they're nervous, they'll do that. Sometimes they'll jump, too. So... Another advice is I'll usually float it out in the middle. Sometimes I'll use straws or something uh, to anchor it across uh, just to kind of wedge it in there with something. Sometimes I'll use just a, a, a net or something along those lines just to float it out a ways. I also like to leave it not where the eggs are going to get blown away completely, but I like to give them a little bit of current and water flow from the filter, and so I'll leave them with just a hint of that in part of the container just so that it then circles around and gives them nice oxygenation. You don't want them to get too claustrophobic. But these guys are so prolific that it should not be a problem. So now I'm going to try to catch a couple more females before uh, this goes on any further and I'm going to probably release two of these and then in the morning, hopefully we will have some eggs. So the eggs will then be moved down to this tank. They'll be put into a specimen box that I created. It's sitting over here with some crushed coral in it and a bunch of cords around it. But it has holes in the top for current flow, but the bottom does not have as much current flow. And so that is for once the eggs have hatched. Now you want your eggs themselves to get oxygen and water flowing past them so that they do not rot. And you'll notice in shrimp and other species of fish, the mother does that um, for them constantly. So that is a nice little tip just to keep it near the filter so that water's moving somewhat, but not so violently that it's gonna blow the eggs along here and out the other end. Also, little snails and things, like I said, will get in here, and they hatch really rapidly with this species, but nonetheless, you can end up with some of them getting munched on. So keep an eye out for that, and it's best to float it rather than, it, than have it right next to something like this. You'll want to move it so that snails and things coming up the glass aren't as tempted to go straight for it. They have to make an effort. So that is the basics to this, and I could not buy this at the store. I had to cut out a piece of acrylic screen, put that over the other screen, 
and there's no middle divider dividing male and female that's not needed uh, and then the eggs should fall down either onto this mat or below it depending they're oftentimes with a lot of different species they're a little sticky and the other thing that could happen is they may try to stick them to like the water lettuce that's up here on top that's more to calm them you can put more plants in but the more plants you have in the more combing through you're gonna have to do later but because I'm not sure if they'll actually be able to make it through the grate here uh, being so fine those eggs I will probably put some water spray in here just so they don't feel quite so alone or out in a clear box open to attack and they may lay on that and if in that case what you do is you pull the parents out after say two or three nights in there and then you can rotate new new parents in take all that foliage out and either you can, I mean you can just put it straight into this tank but the shrimp and snails in this tank in particular would eat it if you have an empty tank then you can put it straight into there and just wait the 80 hours average and see if you get hatchlings but what I will be doing is putting the box with enough flow uh, I'll keep it in this tank and let it rotate with the plants that were in it and the mesh I'll get the adults out and then we'll let that uh, mature see if any fry are inside then once the fry have hatched as I said they can get out through these grates so if they don't all escape too quick on me as I'm noticing that they're tempted to be hatching I will probably place that this container within the other container or some sort of uh, I have a, I don't have one right next to me but I use like the the square milk jugs gallon containers you can get for water those work great if you poke some holes in them so that they're neutrally buoyant and then you can have an outer container so that even if the fry swim out they'll be okay and the snails won't get through but then that allows you to have the oxygen for the the first little while at least the first two days let them have the open grate oxygen so the eggs don't rot so that is my those are my tips for if you're trying to intentionally really raise uh celestial pearl danio or any any egg scatterer that's a very small nano or micro uh fish whatever you'd like to call those um because the more there are in a tank the the bigger chance that they'll be eaten same with snails and shrimp whereas in this in this lower area there may be some cover and things like that you like my new neurites uh tampa aquaculture sent me these and i've got some uh horned zebra neurites and some normal uh neurites so he's got a bunch of those right now on his website so if you, if you need a if you need clams or or any sort of non-reproducing snails, or like assassin snails. He's got all sorts of stuff on tampaaquaculture.com. Check it out. Independent fish farmer out of Florida. Really nice guy with the family in the business. So um, back to what I was saying, though. They get eaten, and their eggs get eaten by their parents really quickly. So you may never have fry unless you have a really, really densely planted tank. And these guys like really dense planting they like grass they like um things like gu guppy grass guppy uh, or java moss things that guppies will use to hide their fry in and and to hide in themselves all that kind of stuff if you've seen other people's videos on how to to keep guppy fry those are good tips just up and down the line even though these ones are even smaller and i've even seen the fry eat these fry that's how small they get so <clears throat> just wanted to warn you on that one and once they get to a quarter inch or so maybe you know a, a quarter of the adult size they're usually okay the adults have very small mouths and if you're doing this outside in in the pond or something you don't have to worry quite as much you can put down mesh or a uh, grate of some sort maybe even uh, a, a, a coarse cheesecloth or those uh, crochet mats you can use anything like that 
and uh, use that with a mop or just let it drop through. However you want to do it where you can remove the adults and you'll have a whole lot of babies. And if you want, you can just pile it full of water sprite and the babies will usually hang out low in, in the water sprite or guppy grass or uh, water wisteria, anything that, that grows quickly and is kind of tangled a tangled mess of things grasses will work too if if you can this uh, rot uh rotala will also work if you have it really thick but uh the little fine areas they like to lay on that since they're so small so i hope you learned a little something i hope this is helpful if you're trying to raise them we'll go over the specifics of ponds and raising them that way later but uh good luck Message me if you have any questions. Take care of yourself. Take care of your critters. And uh, remember to swim on. Take care, guys. And uh, have a good night.